Yeah, can can yeah. can you can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We can see the presentation. Great, great. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Okay. Uh, thank you, thank you, Prof Professor Davidson, as well for allowing me the opportunity to present a part of my thesis uh, in combined heat and power, um, as well as an oversight into South Africa's energy transition, which is very much a part of, of my uh, strategy work. Um, if I can maybe just start with a brief background about myself. Um, Thank you. Chemical engineers bachelors uh, at UK ZN in 2006, um, and then followed by the electrical school MSc, also from UK ZN, uh, with Prof Davidson as my supervisor. Uh, this was actually a combined program between ESCOM, uh, a, a group called TRIP, T H R I P, which is Technology and Human Resources for Industry program at that time and UKZN. Uh, so this, this thesis or these thesis uh, topics, dissertation topics came very much out of industry's need uh, for participation in, in, in um, MSC related uh, uh, topics, so MSC related studies for, for the benefit of industry optimization. So combined heat and power is something we will find now in the next uh, session that I look at uh, or the next slide. We will find that CHP was not as important as it is right now. Uh, and this very much formed the basis of my thesis, uh, which was also a practical case study um, at, at the engine Durban refinery as it is published. Uh, with permission. All right, uh, so I'm also interested in doctoral studies at the moment. Um, it's something that has come up on my mind and I always advocate for university and industry participation where theory meets practical and I feel very strongly about the development of commercialized technologies and entrepreneurship that uh, where opportunities are really right now at at its really ripe stage, um, given the the energy transition and the broad outlook. I also enjoy golf and I enjoy uh, woodworking, um, various types of uh, solid woods. Um, yeah, so I guess that's just an introduction for for me for today. And looking forward to kick off uh, the presentation at this point. Thank you. So, yeah. Any any questions or comments, uh, Prof? Can I can I proceed? By all means, please. Thank you. You can proceed. Thank, thanks very much. So, I thought I'd share a background with with this team on you know where we're coming from as a refiner, what refineries have been like what the world was like essentially you know we depend very dependent on refinery for the production of hydrocarbon based fuels that's for the aviation industry the uh, fleet industry road freight sea freight um and there was a boom in the oil trade there was huge corporate refinery structures emanating from the 1950s and as time went by, you know, I think there was this almost lack of understanding about CO2 levels, about carbon dioxide emissions, about greenhouse gas emissions, and there wasn't enough influence on it. In the 1980s, the focus shifted to plant optimization and security of power supply. So because the rate of expansion was so exponential, the rate at which we could electrify businesses and homes was not keeping up, right? We, I mean, this is a typical dilemma for South Africa. And at that point, power production became of increasing importance. Currently, and this is now since 2019, 
The focus have sh has shifted to clean fuels. We are now in a disruptive era. We are in a battle for existential business in oil refining. Okay, the Paris Agreement of 2015 was a was a very critical juncture for which COVID relied on, and and the whole COVID uh, epilogue that passed us as a pandemic was something that actually revealed a lot about how we do things, and that impact cannot be ignored. It is a large portion of why there's this birth of clean generation um, and a zero carbon fuel type of era. Zero carbon fuel is the total opposite of where we're coming from. We're coming from a boom in oil trade to almost non-existence for refiners. But there is a transition. So I'm going to take a deep dive here into a very technical matter. Um, this is a typical Rankin cycle, and it's got all the makings of an in industry case study and is instrumented as far as possible uh, by the way I did my research. If I can just point here. So what really happens here is that these refineries around the world, they have boilers. They have boilers that convert water into steam. Superheated steam, which is then controlled at a certain exit condition by the superheating and temperature control of that valve. And they consume a lot of HP steam at, as you can see, 400 degrees Celsius, um, six inch pipes, 12 inch pipes, 40 bar HP steam. Just a second for me, please. And the ref these refiners at the same time, they also have a need for MP steam, medium pressure steam. So medium pressure steam is essentially at a lower temperature. It's controlled at 220. It's at 10 bar, and it passes uh, all of its heat through a medium pressure header, which services various boilers around, uh, boilers and uh, sorry, heat exchangers uh, around various parts of the refinery heating processes, typically distillation column, kettle boilers, and so forth, that uh, will utilize MP steam. And then there's a third header called the low pressure header which is sits at about two and a half bar. And there are some consumers for, for the low pressure header, um, but it's the least of, of the, the major circuit. Whatever condensate we can recover, as you can see here for the study, it was determined that we're recovering 60%. We've got to make up the water. So this is a result of losses. So let's think about what's actually happening here. We're using fuel and air to heat up water into steam. We're using the steam around the process. We're letting that steam down through pressure relief valve to different types of steam, different pressures of steam. And we're losing a lot of the steam, as you can see the condensate return is 60%, and then it costs us water as well to make steam. It costs us electricity to drive the pump. And this is how refiners operated for years. Because it wasn't important to them to utilize the properties of steam fully. Let's try and understand what's really happening in terms of a temperature entropy diagram. Typically for a Rankine cycle, uh, there's eight paths in this. This is a very really real Rankine cycle. You probably wouldn't find this in any literature very easily. It's a case study constructive constructed curve. 
uh, just want to switch back here. So the number one is the water getting into the boiler and the number eight is the condensate coming back and it does various things through that time, which we can see here. Saturated steam, two phase flow, then superheated all the way up. And then it can take the path of three to five or it can take the path of three to four. And we'll see the difference between those two now. There's three to five. This is HP steam becoming MP steam. Okay. We'll just see. Uh, still visible there. Yes, we can see that. Okay, okay. Sorry, I think I was on another screen. All right. Um, and put this back in. All right. So, yep. So we're following. We're following here. This is just HP steam coming down to MP, right? This is what the thesis was really about. Let's remove that part, and and let's re look at this. There's a pathway here, three to four. The pathway three to four will achieve this same quality of steam, albeit it will use a less, lesser boiler feed water, right? Because the steam is devalued in a different way. If you look at the way the steam is devalued from the isenthalpic option, which is three to five, right? This part is called isenthalpic, it's constant enthalpy. So there's three to five, there's your red enthalpy line. It's an isenthalpic reduction, okay? And there's three to four. Three to four also devalues the steam, but we call it the isentropic reduction. In other words, this lines of constant entropy must be observed. This is a theoretical line. You'd never achieve isentropic efficiency because systems have inherent irreversibilities. Okay. So going through this exercise, it was found that if we had devalued our steam systems through uh, a turbine, a steam turbine generator, there's um, two megawatts of power available via that letdown system, right? So there's a there's a simplified direct directional indication of uh, the movement of the steam via the two options, um, with a simple explanation of the advantage of then generating the power via a back pressure turbine and letting down steam at slightly lower temperature, which can then be reheated back up with minimum fuel to the desired um, medium pressure to uh, uh, steam. In the case study, this was not required because the devaluation of the steam was still well above the consumer required temperature. So the consumer required 220. We were coming out at 270 from the turbine, if you look at number four. So we still had 50 degrees for which we could desuperheat and then let it down back to 220 for, for the HP, uh, sorry, MP consumers. So it was an excellent option to then couple up a generator to this turbine. Okay. Um, are there any questions at this point, Prof? Or, or no, are we good? We, we follow very closely and I'm very, this is very interesting, more, more so that we have a very strong uh, chemi chemical engineering uh, uh, top guys here and the power engineering. So this is this is fantastic. Continue, sir. Okay. Great, great. I hope, I hope you guys are enjoying it. So I just want to now, explain what the value of this is, right? So refiners are not power generators. They're happy to buy 
fuel gas. They're happy to buy electricity for their pumps. It was not important to them. Obviously, if your existence is now challenged as, an, as a corporate structure, you want to optimize, and this has been happening. So CHP, I believe, still has many industrial opportunities. Right. Many industrial opportunities that have multiple steam headers would greatly benefit from CHP. Right, and, and there's a very important reason why CHP is actually the more preferred generator than renewables. Right, and if you know why, you can shout out the answer, but it's really one word, intermittency. Renewables are intermittent. That's right. So they would they would only you know the sun shines a certain number of hours, the wind blows certain times, different speeds. There should be some storage to buffer that system, one would think, but not with CHP. As long as you have a 24 hour operating facility, you have steam generated all the time, 24 hours a day. It has the beauty of big base load power. And base load power is very, very expensive, right? Base load power is really the carrying minimum carrying power requirement before you start shedding load shedding right. and so forth. So anyway, uh, let's just look at the value of it in in the case study. The two megawatts of power that we would generate from simply moving. HP steam at 40 bar down to 10 bar via the turbine generator is 48 megawatt hours a day. So there's the 24 hour factor, some simple 24 hour operation base load potential of the technology. At the uh, industrial time of use, average price of 1000 rands a megawatt hour. This is about 2019, 20. Uh, rates and costs is equivalent to 15.8 million rand saleable electricity value. In other words, you would save 15.8 million in your electricity bill if you generated this for yourself. And that's per annum. And that's at a 90% capacity factor. So, you know, you expect some shutdown time for your plant uh, once a year either planned or unplanned. So 90% capacity factor for, for 15 million Rand uh, could easily pay back the cost of uh, a generator and the turbine in a couple of years. Uh, in some cases, uh, months. Absolutely. Yeah. So speaking of which, you know, self-generation is heavily promoted right now uh, in South Africa for businesses. Um, decarbonization, I think this term we, we would be familiar with, you know, uh, <laughs> decarbonization for, for the purposes of, of uh, global warming. If anything, you know, um, science has pointed us to CO2 levels becoming uh, uncomfortably high. We've seen I think I think this is bought into with a lot of confidence at this point. Ah, together with that is the fact that it is now cheaper to build a solar plant than it is to build a coal-fired boiler plant or coal-fired power generation plant. It's cheaper by solar and wind which becomes an interesting dynamic because now it is that we will save mankind without coal combustion. And we also, in a financially better space, uh, banks are very interested in it. And I think the, the drive is, is kicking off at this point or has already kicked off. Um, so just to touch on, you know, this decarbonization agenda is driven by by various various um, 
societies around the world. Uh, the Paris Agreement. Paris Agreement. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, can I comment? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, uh, you were saying that using um, solar panels may now be cheaper than coal power stations. Yeah. yeah. Now, um, coal power stations are placed next to the coal mines because uh, it's cheaper to supply coal to the power station and then use transmission lines. So your solar panels you will place where the sun is, right? Well, and it starts yes. sounding it starts sounding more economical that consumers have their own uh, solar panels. Um, yeah, which a lot of yeah. a lot of consumers have, but I can see some resistance from electrical uh, supply. Uh, companies like Eskom, mm. they will see, see a huge amount of loss in business and they have great influence in government. Well, okay, is that the question? I'm just wondering how the politics will play out there. Uh, well, uh, well, look, if you look at bid window five and you look at the um, costs of, okay, you know, cost per, uh, per kilowatt hour that the bidders are putting forth, it's in the 38 to 45 cents, which is even below ESCOM's um, lowest off-peak ITOU rate. That's the LCOE, and probably plus a little bit of profit that you could build into that. And they've got strong green finance funding mechanisms. But okay, agree, we'll watch the space. Uh, how the politics plays out with It'd be interesting. Eskom's also investing, as I understand, in renewables themselves. And I think they will dominate the transmission network. Certainly, wheeling frameworks will become um, a niche market for Eskom. You know, yeah. You see, what I'm saying is that um, whether you like it or not, uh, transmission lines are a very high cost. Mm. Um, let's say Durban, just a random example, the old airport site is still standing vacant. If we were to put a large solar panel thing in there, it would cut, cut out huge costs in transmission lines, wouldn't it? Yeah, well, that may happen, but it's a big problem. The air traffic industry does not like solar, I mean, uh, large scale wind farms, I mean, solar, solar, um, uh, solar plants. You know, that's a different problem entirely. It's environmental, but um, I think we just that would yeah. be a healthy discussion to have, you know, the different forum. Maybe we we'll just uh, get a presentation and then we we'll then discuss this uh, subsequently. But I would just want to encourage that uh, ESCOM is not even meeting the demand in the country. So there's plenty of room for anybody to even be a part, you know, to generate power. And I think that's the focus of most of this uh, current presentation. Yeah. Yeah. You see, I'm worried. I'm going a bit of topic here, but I, I read. Um, one of my students was saying that, oh, it's very soon now. It's here. Yeah, we can, me as a personal consumer here in Westville, I can have, um, let's say, photo photovoltaic panels on my roof and sell electricity to the council. Sounds good. So I went to read the bylaws. And you know how monopolies operate. I have to pay the city council for the privilege. Yes, that's correct. Of selling electricity to them. Yes. Which is totally no, unethical. No, no, no. It's not unethical. You debate that because. Of course it is. Uh, imagine no, 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 I, I had to pay. The, imagine the I had to pay checkers a monthly subscription to buy it groceries pay, from them. This is, this is not apples and grapes, you know. You have to supply a quality of power to the grid at a specific time, specific rate. But none of these prosumers can achieve that. You can't produce power 24 hours a day. You can provide 20 megawatts consistently, you know, for even an hour. You know, so the and you know, from the point of view of control of your operations in your power system, it's a huge problem to admit this kind of uh, small scale producers to have access to the, to, to the network. So no, 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 no so yeah, we'll sorry. That. Yeah, it, it's fine. sorry, I had that. I had that the wrong way around. Um, the, the the way the tariffs worked, 
uh, with for telephone and or electricity, we had to pay a basic deposit monthly whether we used the service or not, because yeah, the, the supplier had to uh, ensure that the service was always available. Now, fair enough, but this is the other way around. I have to, I want to sell electricity to the city council. Yes. I must effectively pay them a bribe so that they will buy it from me. No, not a bribe. You have to pay, 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 pay an access fee to do that. I, I don't agree with that. Uh, maybe we should leave this because I no, think I'm really going off topic. We discussed here. that at a, more, a different forum. But you know, if you if you approach this from a point of view of being a system operator, to have people are dumping the you know two kilowatt hour, ten kilowatt hour into your grid intermittently, and you have to control your frequency and your voltage real time throughout the 24 hour cycle of your of your production is a tough job, you know. And most people use the ESCOM and the network as a, a large scale battery or a backup battery, which is not, uh, you know. Anyway, I don't want to be on both. I want to be on both sides, you know. But let's just let uh, Denzel. Uh, uh, carry on. Yeah, no. debate. Let him do it. Let Something has been worrying me. Yeah. Okay. Let's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. let's okay. go. Back no, to sorry, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> I'm sorry. Good to hear your view. I think that network access fee is something we can debate. I'm sure there's a, going to be a few of these different legislations that we'll want to debate. But I think it's healthier having the debate yeah. than not having the option at all. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. You know, it may work in our favor in the future. All right. So I think maybe that's a good juncture for us to talk about this just transition. Um, or maybe for the next five, five or so minutes um, to close up the presentation. I think this is a very, you know, we've had a very technical kind of thought provoking idea about combined heat and power now and how you know, the devaluation of steam can be can can afford you 15 million rand a year saving by, you know, doing nothing more than just changing the way we change the properties of steam. It's an interesting uh, way of manipulating the molecule to, you know, honor a scientific principle. And now we're talking about this just transition what it is uh so i'll quote i'll quote the international trade union confederation here you know quoting it as a just transition secures the future and livelihoods of workers and the communities in the transition to a low carbon economy it is based on social dialogue between workers and their unions employers government and communities a plan for just transition provides and guarantees better and decent jobs social protection, training and job security and to talk about workers affected by global warming and climate change policies, which pertains to pretty much everyone on the planet, really. Um, and, you know, that's a bit of, bit, of, uh, a bit of a story to digest. But I think the realization here and maybe what I want to hit home uh, with this with this opportunity to talk to the team is that this is here already it's uh it's this disruptive era it is where we starting to really see that there's a curve that we would like to change the direction of which is the warming curve the warming trajectory. There's a lot of information in this, and I'm sure you guys read up, read up on it. But the warming trajectory, we would like to limit it to about one and a half degrees by 2030. If I'm not mistaken, 2035 or so. And the interesting thing about that is that this warming trajectory is an exponential curve. It's it's more difficult to straighten an exponential curve than than to you know straighten a flatten a straight line kind of analogy it's layman's terms. It's 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 speeding up 
uh, with, with the exponential growth in the world's population at the same time. So very interesting dynamic, I think a lot of food for thought perhaps. And I would, you know, I think uh, from my point of view, <clears throat> this, this statement to follow, which comes from Life After Coal, an environmental justice group groundwork in its 2017 report, the destruction of the Haifelt and burning coal, saying to us, a just transition needs to re-envision our economy and our society through a widespread grassroots based debate. We suggest that some starting points can be identified in a more equal and ecologically stable economy based on people's solidarity that serves people's needs, not profit. And such a, and they go on to describe a number of systems that, that becomes this vision that they're creating, a new energy system based on socially owned renewables. I think here one, one of our participants mentioned socially owned uh, renewables, which is excellent. It's part of our transition, new jobs and renewables, large scale restoration and detoxification of ecosystems injured by fossil fuel economy. OK, this is specific to the high felt. A healthier food economy, wise housing, a healthier transport economy, improved municipal services. You know, I mean, it's a, it's it's a vision. It's. I would think, you know, for for us, given that we accept the transition is here, it's an actionable vision. We we could participate in a number of of topics here. Really, I think if if there's more interest in in furthering study for for students, this would be the recommended avenue. Right. In in my viewpoint, so a couple of questions to ask yourself. You know, what does this change mean? Is it, is it compatible to the onset of the 1900 revolution? This one here is also food for thought, guys. If you look at the industrial revolution and the steepness of that exponential CO2 curve, which slope. I mean, think about how we got there and what it's going to take to turn that around. It, it's definitely going to be more than linear. I mean, we're talking about flattening that curve. So, <clears throat> and what does the future hold? Well, one may argue that legacy internal combustion engines will become second to a new mass of fuel cell electric vehicle and battery swapping type technologies in 10 to 20 years. Some companies have um, stalled their production They've terminated some facilities that produce internal combustion engines. Um, and some of these names are in the public domain. Hydrogen. Hydrogen is a very important area, I think, in, in this transition. Uh, maybe not so much for South Africa right now, but from a mobility point of view, companies like, uh, sorry, countries like Japan um, and Europe uh, are heavily dependent on hydrogen as, as part of the uh, transition and they've already uh, requested you know inputs from South Africa on how green hydrogen can be moved to the to the uh, European Rotterdam channel as an example. So there's also a massive scope for private power in South Africa. We have a 100 megawatt limit now gazetted, so embedded generation at 100 megawatts um, is, is a very sizable business venture, 100 megawatts. It's, it's really, I think, no, no small feat if, if you're able to put it together. And there's opportunity. So I will, I will end with, you know, my advocacy again for skills, skills maturity. It's critical now, and, and how is it critical? Because we are seeking international experience at the moment. If you look at some of the, the major installations we have, it's it's companies like Skatec from Norway and um, Sonadix from Italy and so forth. 
companies that that hold these intellectual property rights to these plants and, and operate them for us. But I think it's really up to us now to lever on on this technologies, lever on the opportunities, on the business cases, and uh, develop the skills that that we can employ, even in the project management of these, in the professional management. And I'm mentioning it down here. You know, we seek government and regulatory body approval for an incentivized electrical engineering skills development along the electrical engineering value chain, be it, you know, a wireman or a technician and a consultant. It, it's really going to become this electrical heart and the power generation aspect will become the, the real heart of engineering. You know, it's no longer how well you can run a catalytic cracking unit and a dehydrogenation and, and removing sulfur from <laughs> right. from fuel. So uh, that's that's the transition. Uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your yeah. time. Thank it, you very it, much. Uh, a very, very big thank you, uh, Denzel, uh, for such a very uh, uh, insightful presentation. I mean, I've learned a lot even now from these presentation the, the see other perspectives i never even, i never even figured that uh, that industry is also under threat i was always focusing on the issue of power you know uh, conventional power stations and escom and those businesses being under you know pressure you know so let me open it up for questions and uh, or comments i don't know if professor ratilal has a uh, question of professor uh, can be the reason why I'm asking is because these are uh, chemical engineering professors. He may want to, you know, ask a question or make a comment before we throw it up onto the rest of the floor. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, and thanks, Denzel. Uh, very, very enlightening, very thought-provoking uh, presentation. I think you, you, you sort of tried to clarify a lot of issues, but opened up. Uh, more conversations <laughs> yes. that, that, need to, that need to sort of take place that people didn't think about, you know, and and, yes. and that's very interesting, you know. Uh, those are some of the things that we need to we need to look at. I think mm -hmm. I think you know the 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 concept of 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 replacing uh, 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 coal fired uh, uh, technologies uh, is 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 a huge conversation, and it's not going to be solved immediately. Although you know, with, with all the international treaties that are being signed, uh, reducing carbon, etc. A, 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 a country like Australia saying, you know what, uh, we will burn coal for the next couple of decades. <laughs> yes. You know, uh, so yeah. so and there's a lot of other countries that are saying that as well. So, yeah. you, you know, with the renewables, you got to also think about what would happen in 30, 40 years time when we have to uh, either dispose of all these photovoltaic cells and batteries and things like that. You know what what happens. You know, uh, and 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 those are the conversations that actually need to happen. You know whether whether we're moving in the right direction or not. I mean, I'm I'm into some some alternate fuels, um, uh, which I believe is is essential now. But but going into the future, whether that is that is the perfect technology going into the future, I don't know. Um, because as you, as you know, in your presentation, you brought up a lot of issues that we should be, you know, we should be uh, thinking about. So th thank yeah. you very much, and and I'm glad that I was part of this. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank, no, you thank you for that view. It's a very strong view, and I really appreciate that view because you know uh, we are very fossil fuel minded, and. Uh, if you look at South Africa's uh, energy mix that that's projected in the IRP, yeah, by 2030 we'll still be about 48, 50 percent dependent on coal, and that is assuming all of the wind and solar projects are actually landed. You know, yeah. Well, the the uh, let me just first of all uh, uh, give a chance to Professor KMB uh, before yeah. we yeah. Mm. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. And uh, thank you. Um, Dazel, actually, uh, I was a bit glued to the presentation, especially <laughs> when you when you showed us that, uh, you know, the, 
the, your graph on uh, you know the yes. is it enthalpy whatever it is and yes. all the the pads and all that it's quite interesting it took me back